Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our school board meeting this evening. If you would all please join, rise, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first on our agenda this evening is a presentation on our reopening plan for this fall. Mrs. Zimmerman. reopening uh, amidst a pandemic. So, uh, but we do have a few changes as we come into the into the coming year that we're here to talk about tonight. So, as we work through this agenda tonight, I'll be sharing a little bit about the background and the timeline since we left in June that brought us to the point where we are today. We'll continue to ground ourselves in a singular focus. We'll review details of our back to school plan. I'll talk about the role of the community survey and how that helped to inform the decisions that we've made. And then there will be time for public questions. So different than a traditional Board of Education meeting, we will break that a little bit and conduct that as more of a public hearing. So there's an opportunity for interactive questions and answers. So that being said, as you all know, on May 3rd, we successfully brought 100% of our students back to in-person learning for the last two months of school. Once the state allowed us to move from six feet back to three feet, we were able to accomplish that. And I am proud to say that we did so without any further positive cases during that two month span. It was very successful and so we've learned a lot from that as we prepare for opening this year. Throughout the summer, we were all <coughs> still waiting updated guidance from the New York State Department of Health. And while we were waiting, the CDC came out with a couple <coughs> rounds of updated mandates with recommendations for returning to school. At the end of, the, of July, New York State Education Department sent out a memo encouraging us to wait for this anticipated guidance. Early August, the CDC reissued updated recommendations, which include the universal masking of students, which has turned out to be fairly controversial throughout our region. And then, Almost right on the heels of that, the governor and the New York State Department of Health announced that they would not be issuing guidance for schools this year. After that, we got busy starting to plan. Since we know that, what would we ground ourselves in? We gathered information from the latest CDC documents from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And different trickles of guidance continue to come out, most specifically on August 12th, the New York State Education Department, in absence uh, from direction from the State Department of Health, issued a comprehensive school and health safety guide for the coming school year. For anyone in the audience who is interested, there are hard copies of that out in the hallway on your way in if you want to grab that on the way out, including other documents that we use throughout this consideration process. On August 12th, Delaware County Public Health followed suit, issuing a field advisory memo recommending that districts in their planning follow the CDC recommendations. On August 13th, our Board of Education and our reopening committees met again to start the hard work of developing the plan. Out of that came a subcommittee, which helped us to determine some metrics on which to decide decision-making points if we were to shift to less restrictive protocols, or if infection rates rose, how would we know and when would we know to shift and what would those differences in protocols look like? On August 18th, Utica National issued a statement indicating that districts who, are, who lack alignment with CDC recommendations stand to be vulnerable to, to lawsuits. 
and also stand to jeopardize district insurance coverage if you do not follow those recommendations. Here we are tonight, here in our public presentation on our plans to open school. And on August 24th, you know, I have a question mark. What's happening on August 24th is we will have a new governor who is taking her seat. And there has, she has already, Kathy Hochul has already made statements indicating that she anticipates that masks in schools will be a requirement. So I anticipate coming uh, after August 24th that we will likely be hearing about that. So I'm going to remind a little bit back to that August 4th date. And I felt a lot like this. If you're not familiar with Bergen's paradox, this is a situation uh, a bit in folklore, but certainly in the, in the um, historical documentation that tells the story of a donkey. And what's known, what, what this paradox assumes is that donkeys will travel to whatever is the closest to find nourishment. And so the folklore knows that, that a donkey was equal distance between uh, satiating his hunger and satiating his thirst. And he became paralyzed by this. He had decisions with something really great on both ends of the spectrum, but became so paralyzed that he wasn't able to decide and move anywhere and ultimately perished. We will not be immobilized. We understand that there are uh, very different feelings at both ends of the spectrum, specifically as it pertains to masks in schools. And we completely understand that, and it was reflected in our survey. But at the same time, we need to make a decision grounding ourselves in what we know to be best for students, and given all of the information from medical professionals, which we are not, to try to make the best decisions that we can. So please keep that in mind as we roll out this plan tonight. We know that we are grounded in two priorities. We must return all students to in-person learning, and we are fully dedicated and prepared to be able to do that. At the same time, we have a single obligation to continue to maintain the health and safety of all of our students and staff in the best way that we know about. We take this decision very seriously. We know that when parents and caregivers send their children into our care, that they trust that we will make the best decision to keep them safe while they are within our walls. We also now are in a much different position than we were throughout the year last year. We now can rely on experience and what that has taught us to inform decisions that we make. We also have additional sources of local and regional data to determine our protocols to make us even more agile and able to monitor and adjust. So, we went to work with our reopening committee another, one more time. Again, we had a very diverse stakeholder group, uh, including a few additional parents who joined us this time. Uh, we also opened it up to any teachers and staff who wanted to join us, even if they hadn't previously served on the committee. Uh, so it was nice to see some new faces come out to, to share in this, uh, in this struggle. Together, we reviewed all the guidance documents that are outside on that table from the State Education Department, CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, and from our local health departments. We reviewed every comment on the community survey, read, evaluated, and considered that. We consulted with Bassett healthcare professionals and um, designees from our public health. We looked at many different ideas, and as I mentioned before, we formed that subcommittee to look at metrics. With the CDC recommendations in the most recent form, we know that we have to prioritize efforts to return all students to in-person instruction. What was a little also new this year is that remote-only models can be offered at district discretion. And they're recommending that those continue to be offered for students with highly vulnerable medical needs that can't be accommodated in our school environment. But, but who are still in jeopardy if they are in a communicable setting. It recommends, uh, again, universal use of face masks, indoors only, but not outdoors. And another significant change is those daily health screenings, temperature checks are not recommended any longer. What has not changed are requirements for hygiene and cleaning, 
The social distancing still remains at three feet in classrooms. I'll get into that in detail a little bit later. And that we must continue to move forward with all of our initiatives in the district to address instruction and to continue to provide the same high quality instruction with the same level of rigor and pacing as we move through another year of instruction. So as we move into the details of our fall plan, all students are coming back. And this is something to celebrate. And this is something we're excited and very proud of. UPK through 12. And I always smile because we have that UPK starting this year. I see Mrs. Maple with a big grin on her face. It gets her every time. Um, our athletic and extracurricular opportunities will resume. Of course, that will be based on any additional uh, requirements or guidance that may change. We are opening our doors to visitors this year. We still will be conducting um, just the face-to-face face health screenings for visitors who come in, but we really want to get back to that sense of normalcy a bit um, and have those doors open again. So here's the big question, use of face masks. We are starting the school year with universal masking regardless of vaccination status, based on all of the rationale that I noted before. That is the continued recommendation of medical professionals, that is the recommendation of our insurance company, and that, that is where we will be opening our doors to, to start the year. We will be providing masks, just like we did last year, or they can be provided by families. Mask breaks, at least to start the year, will be at teacher discretion. So all of this really represents no change from where we left last spring when we had everybody back. Masks are not required and will be optional outdoors. We will be encouraging teachers to take classes outdoors whenever it's feasible or reasonable to do so. And a set of metrics have been developed to determine when we can move to a less restrictive play, uh, practice regarding masks in classrooms. So at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, one of our awesome teachers, Makaya Ass, to the stage. Uh, Makaya was on the subcommittee that worked on developing these metrics. Um, the other teacher was Mr. All, Phil All, and then there are also two parents who served on the Greater Reopening Committee who also served on this subcommittee. And together they worked hard and consulted with many outside professionals in developing uh, what these set of metrics are. So I'm going to turn this over to Makaya to present the next few slides. Thank you. Uh, so, as Mr. Zimmerman mentioned, uh, Mr. All led us in our committee in uh, developing some metrics to determine how we could be more flexible uh, as we move forward. Uh, the second bullet point there talking about countywide and local data resources, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at the situation as it is in particular to us and not necessarily how things sit for the state or how they sit for the nation. Obviously, uh, things can be very different in different locations. We wanted to maintain flexibility to um, help our students and staff operate in the best way possible. Uh, no, <laughs> nobody likes wearing masks, uh, so we wanted to be able to be flexible about them. Uh, at the same time, I guess to use an analogy, uh, if you've ever been at a sporting event outside and there's a lightning strike or a roll of thunder, thunder and you have to sit for 45 minutes, 30 minutes in, you're pretty sure, and everybody else is pretty sure that that was one random roll of thunder. Um, we want to make sure that we're being safe and cautious, uh, first and foremost. Uh, but we also don't want to necessarily um, engage in practices that aren't necessary uh, beyond where they are. So, um, as I mentioned, we consulted with Bassett uh, through DASH, uh, Delaware County as well. Uh, we relied primarily on CDC recommendations. Um, so as noted, the phase one, the first phase would be to have universal masking, as Mrs. Zimmerman already went over. Um, phase two, uh, instead of the two and two rule, what we're looking at is a two week period during which there have been no positive cases on the district campus and the district, I'm sorry, the county positive test rate on a seven day rolling average is at 2% or lower. Sorry, is that better? <coughs> All right, thanks. Um, so if we have two consecutive weeks without a case on campus and county testing is 2% or lower, we feel confident that represents that we're in a safe place, relatively speaking, and we can pivot to 
maintaining masking in transit, um, but once students are settled in a situation in which there will be a reasonable expectation of social distancing of three feet, masks could be removed. Uh, that would exclude situations like um, PE classes that would have uh, high levels of face-to-face -face interactions or kindergarten, kindergarten rug activities where it's reasonable to expect that students would be in each other's space. Um, but in situations like a standard classroom setting, students could then unmask. Uh, we recommend then, uh, as an extension of that, that to sort of say within the county uh, and realizing that it's a large geographic location, there could be a flare up in one area of the county that doesn't necessarily impact us here at Delaware Academy. Uh, so that for every consecutive additional two week period without a case here, we would then allow for some flexibility and the 2% metric uh, for the county test positivity rate. Uh, so we thought that would make sense to add a percent for every two weeks. Uh, our recommendation is then that in the event of a positive case on campus, we go back to phase one. Right? We want to make sure that we're cautious as we need to be, uh, and, and we don't uh, wait until all the horses are gone to close the barn door. So that's what's outlined here. Um, so as soon as we would have a new case, which ideally we would go without, uh, but in that case, we would revert back to phase one. Um, if the countywide testing positivity rate exceeds 2% um, over that course suit, then that may also be a factor that would trigger a return to phase one. Any, any questions? Just Mr. one Hank? question. Yeah, Micaiah, thanks for that work that you guys have done. That's really good work. It's like feeling your way through the dark and putting all these solutions and, and inputs together. A question I had, and I don't know if you know, if you guys looked into this, but it's it's a curiosity I have, is what is our current rate of testing in Delaware County on a daily? Rate of testing as far as? Yeah, like how many tests are we doing these days? I used to know last year. That I'm um, not sure of, uh, and I think the one thing that was brought up in the committee was uh, the idea that if possible we could use some of the federal funding to do some pool testing here. Mm -hmm. uh, that would increase the testing numbers and get a yeah. better overall picture of what the actual positivity rate is so we don't have a self-selection bias Yeah, only the sick people are getting tested. That, that's a little bit of my concern is that because we don't do a lot of testing in Delaware County, that to get tested is, is not just a little thing. People are really kind of sick and right. so hitting 2% probably won't be that hard because we're not doing thousands of tests. Right. Now, I understand when SUNY Delhi you know, when their testing comes online, it, the denominator may get much larger. I'm not sure of that because they do pool testing. I don't know whether they're counted because it goes in a pool of 12, I understand. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that all works, but our, that may go way up if that comes online. I don't know, but my concern is just that we may never ever get below or above below 2% just because there'll be a point where we're not, it's not even testing will only happen for people that are like really severe. Right. Yeah, so I, I just don't know where we're at now. I guess that's why I asked the question. Yeah, and I think that that makes sense to look at as far as you know, how, how voluminous is your data set. Um, and then maybe that's an adjustment that the board or superintendent choose to make and say, you know, it's a bigger, we, we looked at the 2% as a reasonable and cautious figure, but it's, that it's not adequately reflecting the actual percent of yeah. cases. I, and I don't know, I don't say I have the answer at all. I'm just throwing it out there as a, you know, something to look at for, yeah. for how much testing is really, and I think you bring up a good point about our own testing here, maybe another thing thrown in there to support that, if we get to that point. I, I, yeah, this is, I don't know if you can answer it, Micah, but maybe Kelly can. So. Is, is the Department of Health, local Department of Health, changing the way they report anything? Because it's the county, you don't know if it's our school district, Delhi, is it, you know, a, another school district far, like the other town far, several miles away that, like, or do you know, are they changing that at all? Or is it, is, so we're not gonna know. No. It's the county, we don't know Correct. how much is in our Correct, yeah, their reporting methods and their platform, when you go onto their yeah. website, 
has not changed in the way that they report overall positivity rates in the county. Okay. And then my other question is, um, um, do they post it daily or weekly, like the percentage? So for the countywide positivity rate, they do they do it da weekly, daily? That's updated. That's updated daily? every day, okay. and then every Thursday there's a total rehab of the entire okay. region. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Epps. Uh, really great job. The few minutes that it took him to present this to you tonight is truly no indication of the hours that the subcommittee put into trying to nail down a truly moving target. Um, so, and it also illustrates that this truly is not any one person putting down any particular edict. This has been a group effort uh, by a number of people in the district. So thank you for that. So to move on, um, physical distancing, we're maintaining the three feet between students and classrooms. Three feet in cafeterias, we are using assigned seating so that we can, so this achieves two pieces. The assigned seating gives us the ability to know discreetly if there is a case for contact tracing. In another slide, I'll explain how those metrics will continue to work this year. But it also takes lunches um, out of classrooms and back into, into the cafeterias, which was a, a much needed uh, return to that piece. We want to still encourage, however, small group collaboration. We don't want our students sitting in tombstone rows all day. We still want them up and away from their desks. We want them outside where they can collaborate and have more authentic experiences. We want our students to work in small groups. We want them to do the think pair share. So that is still encouraged. But when they are within three feet, they just need to have that mask on. Uh, this has not changed six feet between students when singing or playing a wind instrument. Um, in PE, outdoors whenever they possibly can, including through the winter. There are many winter activities that we can do outdoors for PE. We are just, uh, the recommendations to try to limit shared equipment in PE, but of course, that shared equipment will continue to be clean and disinfected. Our daily cleaning and disinfection protocols from buildings and grounds perspective has not changed. That will continue. The other piece before I move into the community survey is, as I mentioned at the beginning, the CDC no longer is recommending daily temperature checks or screenings. So Delaware Academy will not be engaging in those again this year. We found from past experience that not one student was triggered at the doors coming in this year as having a temperature. And if they did, it could have been because they were really bundled up on that bus and came in maybe a little hot, but after a few minutes in the office and taking off the winter hat and the, and the uh, puffer coat, cooled down pretty quick. Um, we also found that when parents were recording um, their daily screenings online, that the response rate was, was, did not meet a threshold where we could reliably determine um, and use that information. We are much more effective at identifying kids once we have eyes on them in school, in the classrooms, and then getting them to the nurse and to home. Uh, in terms of the community survey, many strong and varied feelings were expressed. All were reviewed and considered. The majority of respondents were parents or guardians. Out of our total uh, parent, guardian, student population, there were only 177 respondents on this particular survey. So that's just to put things in perspective a little bit to try to get a sense of how representative these were of the totality of our population. They were, the community was pretty split on the use of masks. Uh, the majority, 55%, desired no mask use at all. But now we know from additional um, information that's been coming out that we just cannot open um, under that guise. There was advocating for choice for parents and students. But there was also an opposite and many who were supporting masking based on the increased infection rates and the prevalence of the Delta variant and the, the increased spread of the virus, uh, and many advocating to follow recommendations of the CDC. So what does this mean for us? In the elementary school, this means no more hybrid models. Our remote-only teachers from last year are being returned to the classroom. As are our AIS teachers are returning to math and reading AIS, we are adding our UPK class. 
We have new and additional programs to address social emotional learning and instructional focus and a lot of professional development, even that we started last year, to focus on those um, learning gaps, targeting those gaps within our curriculum and in the skills of our students. What does this mean at the middle and high school? Again, no hybrid models, no more synchronous instruction for our teachers and classrooms. We will be returning to the use of lockers. The only exception is middle school right now does not have lockers because of our capital projects. Those are a little delayed on their arrival, but as soon as they get in, the, uh, the surface is ready for those to be installed right away, and we will resume use of lockers uh, throughout the entire school. We will have assigned seating in the cafeteria, uh, In-person physical education has returned to our master schedule, so everyone will be scheduled regularly for PE. Uh, return of athletics and extracurriculars. We are maintaining the same arrival and dismissal schedule as last year, however. If you backtrack to two years ago, some of our students and families may remember that there was an opportunity to come in and all the students kind of gather in the cafeteria at a mass gathering before they were released to go to classrooms. We're still not quite in a position where we can comfortably mass gather. So we are maintaining that same arrival and dismissal schedule where um, our students can come in, do the grab and go breakfast, and then they report directly to a homework. So remote only instruction. I know that this was a question that came up that was um, sent in by somebody at home. It's no longer required as an option by uh, the New York State Education Department, but it is recommended in cases where there is documented medical need. We will be providing that in this case. I'm going to ask Kristen Shearer, our Director of Special Education Student Services. She is overseeing this process to talk with you a little bit more about what that will look like. Hi, everyone. So we are really excited to have everybody return in person, but we do recognize that there are some students who uh, might qualify for a fully remote program because they are medically fragile. We do have a form that was outside. We'll also be putting it on our website. But let's take a look at what that's going to look like for students who do qualify. Um, there is an application process. We do have a committee that um, includes our, our medical people, our people from DASH, um, and our administrators that will take a look at that application. Um, again, like I said, medical professionals. It's long term. This is not for students who are on quarantine. It's not short term. This is long term. Um, we are going to provide it through our ONC BOCES, an online program that they are calling remote program. Um, it's offered for kindergarten through 12th graders, again, who qualify. It is taught by um, New York State certified teachers um, that will be hired by ONC. And, um, you know, it's going to meet all the graduation requirements. It's um, based New York State learning standards. And like I said, it's definitely short term. It's not for our students who are on quarantine. So there is a process. And um, the deadline actually to apply is this Friday. So if there's anybody out there that, that contact me, we'll get you an application, but we're also reaching out to families. Thank you. Um, I also know there's another question too that, okay, what if my child is identified for a 10 day quarantine? What happens then? So in those cases, we will be asking teachers to have work prepared. Just like prior to COVID, if you have a student who decides to take a vacation during the school year, or is out for a prolonged period of time. That will be provided to our students with an expectation that teachers will be touching base with those students on at least on a daily basis. Many of our teachers also are planning on continuing to maintain a Google Classroom where, the, where information is uploaded every single day so that students who are at home can just log on to the Google Classroom, see what type of instruction is being missed, and then upon their return, there can be opportunities, whether that be a student dropping into a, a previously scheduled lab or opportunities to continue to get that support for work that they may have missed. Um, also, when we say the 10 consecutive days, rarely does that mean two weeks of school because the 10 days includes a weekend uh, the majority of the time. So we will address those on a case-by-case -case basis, but that is not the intent 
of the online remote platform. Transportation, the survey told us that about 76% of our respondents will continue to require transportation. Masks continue to be required for all students, drivers, and aides. This is not just a New York State Education Department requirement, but this is a public transit, New York State public transit requirement. So there's absolutely no choice as far as that goes. The one change is that where needed, students can be acceptable for them to be seated greater than one shower per seat. Uh, we'll continue to try to load and seat families together, obviously. But it also allows us to be more flexible this year on those you know, day to day changes. So whereas last year we said we cannot accept that at all because of our limited capacity on the buses, this year we'll be able to enjoy more of that flexibility in supporting our families to get kids where they need to go because we have some greater flexibility with seating on our buses this year. As long as the weather permits, we're also encouraging our drivers to have windows down on our buses to increase that air circulation. Currently, and this again could change as soon as tomorrow, uh, but currently there are no restrictions for outdoor athletics or extracurriculars. We know at this point that indoor contests, practices, events, uh, inclusive of athletics and extracurricular activities require masks for participants and spectators, but there are also currently no restrictions on the number of spectators. We have not heard that yet. Again, this is a moving target that could change, but this is where it stands as of today. The New York State Education Department in that comprehensive document indicated that high risk sports should be canceled in areas of high community transmission unless all participants are fully vaccinated. Delaware County is currently in a high uh, area of community transmission. This puts districts in another precarious position because legally we cannot ask you what your vaccination status is. We cannot require you to report your vaccination status. If our athletes or uh, families of athletes or if our students participating in extracurricular activities choose to volunteer that information to us, it can only help. And it would certainly help to maintain um, a regular sports season as we move forward. Additional details will come out as we get more information from the state on that. So what if there's a positive case? The parameters for contact tracing have not changed. When there's a positive case, they still use the six-foot radius as the rule to identify who would be targeted for quarantine. However, what has changed is there are new considerations and new questions that consider vaccination status of people who may have initially been in, uh, targeted for quarantine, and they also ask, what was the mask wearing? Was everybody wearing masks within that area? And then from that, the public health will determine who then is triggered for the mandatory quarantine. I anticipate that with the increase in vaccinations and with the diligent mask wearing, that we may see a decrease of people targeted for quarantines. Um, if you do have a widespread closure, so for some reason, if the state comes in and re-declares a state of emergency based on a public health um, epidemic and there is a widespread closure, we will not return to hybrid models. We will shift to a completely remote status. Our students here enjoy one-to-one -one, uh, devices. We have the ability to pivot and move directly to that if we need to do so. And again, as we've done through the year last year and a few times this summer, I will certainly be communicating to everybody every positive case that we have in the district. So a few of the concluding thoughts, and then I'll open it up for questions. We fully recognize that this is still far from ideal. We know that. Um, however, we will remain true to our goal, and we will remain true to our plan with the ultimate goal of keeping our schools open to the greatest degree that we have control over. Some other factors that still are under consideration, that we still may hear more information about, include the future role of vaccination status in our decision making. Are there opportunities for pool testing that would enable us to respond even more discreetly and keep our schools open? We will certainly continue to pivot, monitor, and adjust. I talked about the shifting to a fully remote model. 
We don't know what the future availability is for vaccine for children under the age of 12. We know manufacturers are working on that. That will only help us uh, as, we, as we move on. And again, this is a, that moving target. Any and all of this could be subject to change if we receive information of updated requirements or guidelines in the next couple of weeks. So, what can you do to help us? We know that we have, you know, we're out of the farmer's market and people approach our tent and say, what do you need me to do? I want my child back in school. Please tell me what to do. Uh, please make sure that your medical records, vaccination information, all of that is up to date and submitted uh, to your school nurses. Support your child's daily attendance. Monitor for symptoms of illness. So while I say support, make sure your kids are coming to school this year. At the same time, if there are any symptoms that are found, please keep your child home to keep us all safe. Make sure you're modeling proper hygiene, health, and safety practices. Please communicate. Keep those lines of communication open. We don't like things to fester. If you have a question or concern, contact your building principal. And if you're not receiving district emails currently, please contact us. Over the past year, at the suggestion of one of our parents, we started emailing everything out in a mass email in addition to posting things on our website and Facebook and social media pages. So if you're not receiving those for some reason, it could be that there's an incorrect email in our school, um, or it could be just an error in our overall um, system. So please let us know if you're not receiving uh, those emails. First day of school is Tuesday, September 7th. We are so excited and anxious to get everybody back uh, and in here. Our teachers are ready to go, our administrators are ready to go, and I know some students who I've talked to who are equally as excited. So I'm happy to announce our Bulldogs are back, and at this point I will open it up for any questions. Okay, great. Um, I'm sorry, your name please? Kathleen Hi, Kevin. Uh, learning levels. I feel like, I mean, the question being, if COVID doesn't surge again, like last year, but things were, I hate to say, bumped down last year, you know, they didn't cover the materials they should, they weren't prepping for the events, the last canceled, and, you know, they didn't cover the level of material that I expect them to. So, I guess, is that again this year, or is it going to be able to do that? Yep. All right, so I'm going to attempt to uh, restate your question so everybody at home can hear it. So the question from Kathleen is regarding what, what can I expect as a parent in terms of the, the pacing, the rigor, the amount of curriculum that my child will be exposed to this year with a concern that last year the curriculum, um, and I'll just repeat your words, felt like it was dumbed down <laughs> or pieces of the curriculum were missed um, and can she expect that to continue to be the case this year? So one of the first things that I'll say in response to that is to, to try to change your thinking on that just a little bit. Because last year, um, absolutely, there were cases where we needed to narrow and deepen the curriculum to focus on what we call priority standards uh, in, in anticipation for just not knowing where COVID would lead us. But at the same time, we also charged our teachers with it. We built structures to ensure that are that the pacing of our curriculum remain the same. So in other words, um, unlike some other places or experiences that would have kids in school a couple days and then repeat the same curriculum again a few days later and leave the other half in limbo, we did not do that at Delaware Academy. We became so astute at providing that continuity of learning day to day that in fact we maintained the pacing to a much greater degree than we even thought we'd be able to. And that was reflected in performance outcomes when we measured the achievement in a bunch of different levels, both at the elementary and at the high school, and showed that our students here did not experience nearly the degree of gaps and skills that we were afraid they may have. So that being said, I can confidently say that moving forward with 100% of our students back in seats, that I fully expect that we will be completely back to normal in terms of pacing. What will change is our teachers have been working on what's called gap analysis. 
So they have reflected on their curriculum last year and those areas or those skills that they feel may have been uh, missed for whatever reason may be, they've been asked to, to scaffold that or to take those pieces and look at where that serves as a building block into the next year's curriculum to fold that in to address some of that. In addition to that piece, we will be uh, engaging in screenings of all of our students within the first month of school that, so that we have, again, another source of data on which to build compensatory or additional services for students who may need that. In some cases, that may be provided through academic intervention services. In other cases, it may be provided through learning labs at the high school. And in other cases, it might be addressed what we call a tier one or for all students who are in the classroom. So we thought long and hard about that specific concern. And although I think we did a pretty good job addressing it last year, we have pieces in place to not only move us forward, but to address any gaps that may have resulted from last year. Um, and just to add, all of my questions, understanding the fact that, you know, we were put in a situation nobody ever could foresee. And teachers did the best they could to navigate a world with no change. I mean, you take a 30 year seasoned teacher who, you know, was an incredible teacher, and you say, Here's your new computer, and I've never used one before, but get in front of the camera and teach. You know, so there's, you know, it's understandable some of the limitations that we could face. No, I, I appreciate the recognition of that, Kathleen. Um, on the quarantine, on one of the last slides, we talked about the fact that there might be. Um, like the CDC, Michael, the Department of Health, they recommend based on exposure in the classroom that how far apart people were and who actually needs to quarantine. If the CDC or if the Department of Health is telling you, well, you know, only these students that are kind of sitting near this kid need to quarantine, so nobody can wear a mask, you know, do the parents have the opportunity to be, I mean, I'd like to be told, your kid was in the room, the Department of Health says they don't have to quarantine because they weren't sitting there taking the question. But it's left up to you. you know, because in my house, we have two elder people that are at very high risk. If I think that the child has at all become exposed, she's going to be quarantined for a different part of the house until it's been enough time. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not told because my kid just didn't sit next to that kid, you know, I mean, I feel like I should get to know and decide for myself if I want them to quarantine based on the being in the same room. All right, so, so Catherine is just asking in the question of if there's an identified quarantine in a classroom and my child is not necessarily triggered for quarantine because they were not in proximity to the infected child, but was in the classroom in general, will I as a parent be notified of that so that I can retain my decision to self-quarantine if I elect to do that? Is, it, did I get, is that correct? Okay. So that's also a slippery slope because we have to be careful in our communications that we are preserving the confidentiality of the individual. So what we've been doing is saying, it's the, in the communications, which I'm sure you've read, whenever there's an infection, that there's been one at the middle and high school. But what I can't do is say what classroom it occurred in. I will tell you that for every child that we pass a name along to the Department of Health, to Public Health, whether they're identified for quarantine or not, that parent will get a phone call. So you will know if your child was at least within that six foot radius. But beyond that, um, we cannot share, you know, that your child was in a class with an infected child. I just wish they would widen the six feet. Yeah, if your kid is within the same, uh, you know, vicinity. Um, if, just to respond to a little bit more, Kathleen, if you are ever in doubt, and have a specific question or concern for the health of your particular child, please don't hesitate to call, okay? Because we may be able to have a different conversation, um, you know, to assess the, the relative safety risk. Uh, two more. One, um, I, you said that you can't ask people for vaccination status. Has the school thought about a voluntary survey just to kind of get an idea of how many kids people are willing to answer it? Yeah, so Kathy is asking, has the school thought about a voluntary survey to assess vaccination status? We've absolutely thought about a lot of different ways to achieve that information. We just need to make sure that 
that we're doing it in a way that is legal and it does not infringe upon upon FERPA or, or HIPAA. Um, FERPA specifically applies to schools. Um, but we have thought about that. We just have not rolled out a discrete plan for that yet. Um, and lastly, uh, this may seem on the frivolous side, but uh, you mentioned lunch uh, assigned seating. Uh, is that different from last year's distance seating? I mean, it is different from last year. Yeah. So the question is, is it's only chance to interact with their with their friends mm -hmm. is during that lunch session, especially considering the limited hallway time. And you know, in my daughter's friends are very outspoken when I tend to be around. We have a lot of mental health issues going on, and a lot of these kids are very depressed and very they want to lose and be over, you know, and then they can interact with their friends again. Yeah, I, love, I want to know that too. <laughs> um, so the, the last question from Kathleen is, with recognition for the mental health needs and what our students have suffered because of lack of socialization, in the cafeteria, how is this different from last year, number one? And number two, how will that assigned seating work? Because this is my child's only opportunity to socialize with her peer group, um, and that's something that, that is very important to us. So yes, this is different from last year. Last year in the cafeterias, we had additional um, we had additional lunch periods. Number one, we expanded into other spaces for lunches. Number two, so that we could maintain the six feet of distancing in the cafeterias. This year, um, in an effort to try to move back toward a, a more normal master schedule, uh, and at the same time try to get students back in the cafeterias to offer that socialization. Um, I consulted with the public health on this piece, and the recommendation from actually two different county departments of health was that if you are going to move toward three feet in the cafeterias, that you use assigned seating to control for um, students staying within their peer groups on a day-to-day -day basis, because that's really truly the most vulnerable space, because kids remove their masks to eat. We have not decided how that will be assigned yet, but we saw that kind of as a compromise between how we moved from the situation we were in last year to achieve and address more of those concerns that you just mentioned as we move into this year. So we haven't decided how we determine who sits where. Um, I'm going to guess that students will have a say in that and will be able to choose their peer group, but once you make that choice, you do need to stay seated in those same seats day after day. All right, I'm just going to glance real quick at any other questions that may have come in from our viewers at home. Um, and just as I mentioned, um, Kathleen's name here, I have Rose who is asking about religious waivers. Will a religious waiver be granted for those who oppose the COVID vaccine or wearing a face mask? Um, she's referencing a local private college is not accepting religious waivers. Um, as a public school, we have to consider religious exemptions, and we will follow the pre-existing laws that pertain to religious exemptions should that, um, should that apply. So if you do, um, we will not automatically follow suit because we're a public school and we cannot. Uh, so if you or your family does have concern or feel strongly about religious exemptions, the, the closest laws that pertain to that are in relation to other vaccinations. We know that this came up with required vaccinations a few years ago, and that's what we would reference for starting to make those determinations. So if you feel that that does apply to you, um, please call our district, and we will work and take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there is a question from Katie about no online option for DA. That is not true, as I'm sure you've heard the presentation tonight. We are offering a remote only option uh, for students who are medically fragile. And there's also a question about the quarantine, uh, which I believe we addressed in the presentation as well. And then Katie also mentions that the Delta variant is twice as contagious as the original COVID virus. There's data that causes more severe illness. What are you doing to protect students under the age of 12 that are not able to get the vaccine? Um, I feel that the protocols that we had in place throughout the year last year in our elementary school 
um, we're, we're very effective in controlling the spread of the virus, especially since we brought everybody back the last two months of school and we did not have one positive case. So as you can see, starting with universal masking, I think is the first um, and foremost uh, greatest protection against that. So we are not implementing anything in addition to that or anything new, as the question asked, uh, is there anything extra? But we are maintaining those protocols as we did last year. And that is the last question from home. Any other questions in the audience? One Kathleen, one more. That's, so that's why we're here, it's okay. Um, we know what the county percentage is right now. And the, um, if you had said two weeks of no positive cases, Mask. Is that high school and elementary school combined? Like if you have a positive case in elementary school, do the high school kids have to start masking? Give me a second, I'm going to look that okay. up right now. Okay. I think so. for this week. There are 90 active cases countywide, 61 new positive in this week. Out of 96,404 lab reports that were received. Wow. wow. But there is a dashboard. I'm just struggling to put my finger right on it. That does the where we are seven-day rolling average from. In my computer, in my office, I have this as a tab. It's always up, and I check it every day. Uh, let me just check one more, one more spot. Three point five. Three point five. Thank you, Mr. Verse Four. Up oh, and there it is. That can be found at forward.newyork.gov backslash percentage positive results county dashboard. You just put it in. You can look by region. Um, or specifically by county. And that's what we consulted on a daily basis last year when we're navigating athletics. So, thanks. All right. Um, I totally understand that this may not be a comprehensive representation of the full questions that you might have, but given this information tonight, this presentation will be posted to our website. You will also be receiving information at home regarding the conditions under which we are opening. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call your principal or even call our office. So thank you. I'm sorry, Kelly. She had a second part to that question. I'm sorry. Did I miss the second part to your question, Kelly? No, that's okay. I just had asked if the elementary school gets a positive case, is the high school going to ask? Oh, correct. Yes. So that, that switch in protocol. The intention right now is for that to apply K through 12. Um, based on what our active cases look like within our schools. But if that's correct, if we have the two weeks without any reported cases, that leniency would be provided K through 12. Anybody else? Thank you, Mrs. Zimmerman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have our DCMO BOCES team here to give us a presentation <laughs> on the Instructional Support Specialist Career Destinations Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
this point. So while our team from DCM Overseas is setting up, we've invited them to come here tonight uh, because as I mentioned earlier, we have every intent to continue to roll forward this year. We will not be immobilized by COVID. We are continuing to move forward with instructional programs, with the programs to address social emotional needs, and with our overall intention to expand pathways for our students and provide greater opportunities for our students to have experiences in the workforce. And we are relying on a variety of re uh, resources to help us continue to move forward. And this is uh, this is just one of several that, that we're considering. So are you ready to roll? Ready to roll. Thank you, Mr. Dewey. Can I add? Oh, I turned it off. There's a little switch right at the top. Got it. Well, thank you for welcoming us tonight. Uh, Third Destination is a program which we started uh, pre-COVID. Uh, COVID did have some interruptions for us, and now we are in the process of restarting it. Um, it was nice to have Kenny uh, and Kelly uh, with us for the presentation that we did at both schools. And uh, tonight I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot snippet of this, not the whole full hour and a half that we did at uh, rural schools. And I'd like to introduce our team, Martha Ryan, who is with us tonight. Martha is the person who has been doing a lot of grant writing for us. Uh, we have had, uh, and you'll see this uh, as we move through the presentation, uh, two rounds of uh, the regional grant funding that we have gotten uh, because of Martha and that's been able to allow us to step in the program. And then uh, Chris McCall Hopkins is with us as well. Uh, Chris is our work-based coordinator, and she's been working with the school districts. And then uh, Jen Waite is with us tonight as well, and she is the director of the program in the CTE. So this is really a component of our CTE program, and it's, a, it's an extension of that. Um, one of the things that we really are trying to do, I guess probably the, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is to keep students here upon graduation. Now, that's, that's a big task. Um, at the BOCES, we've taken 44% uh, of the juniors and seniors in our CTE programs across the region. But there's 56% of those students that don't necessarily get career orientation or career uh, exploration opportunities um, at district level. It's somewhat hit and miss. It depends on whether the counselors, and what the loads are, the counselors and the, and, and the principals, and their coordination within the district with regional employment. Okay, this program is hopefully going to bridge the gap between the education of students, right, and the workforce in, uh, in our industry that we have uh, locally. So some of the barriers we see, and these are not anything new. This isn't. Uh, rocket science, this, this has been occurring for a long time. Um, we have focused as a, as a nation, I would say, on being successful means a four-year degree, okay? And we know now, specifically, uh, that um, we have people in the trades that are making as much as or more than starting teacher salaries, okay? And teachers, as we all know, require a master's degree now, okay? And so this is something that has been a, somewhat of a stigma, I guess you would say, or a block um, in our culture. Um, that prevalent college mindset is not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's bad. Okay? I'm just saying it is there, and, it's not, and as we know, it's not there for all students. Um, skill and trade, uh, understanding and underestimation of what you can do and how you can elevate yourself uh, by being in the trades, okay? We have a lot of students who are going through our welding program right now, and we are able to connect them to Raymond's, and they're receiving some significant salaries, okay? Some of them starting around $60,000, is that correct? Okay. Um, and then also just the limited awareness of local employment opportunities for our students. Okay, and then some of the barriers that exist between industry and education. Um, I was an agriculture teacher, I taught for 25 years, 
And it was very evident that um, we in education, our focus was to graduate students, okay? And that didn't necessarily always line up with what employers needed in the region, okay? Yes, they need, you needed a high school diploma, but you also needed those skills to be successful in the workplace. And that necessarily is not something that is always provided to the level in which an employer is looking for. And so um, what we need to do is expand, okay, our involvement in providing awareness, okay? Looking for people in business and industry who could mentor our students, okay? I, I'll give my example here real quick. When I was a, a, a wee shaver, I guess, in, in uh, growing up, I was about five years old, in the veterinary, I grew up on a dairy farm, and the veterinary came and did an operation on a cop. And I just, my eyes were big, my heart was pumping, I'm going, I'm going to be you when I grow up. And I told him that right then and there. I said, I want to be a veterinarian. And this was a person that I connected with. This is an opportunity that we need to provide all of our students, okay? Somebody to emulate that is in industry, that they can understand that they could actually be or become. And that veterinary came back to the farm multiple times through my life. He was uh, the local you know, farm veterinary. Uh, he would always ask me, how's your grades? I kind of went and said, well, they're okay. He said, well, you know, in order to get into vet school, you got to have really good grades. So you got to get good grades. I was an outdoors kid. I wasn't necessarily that kid that was interested in taking English class, okay? But I persevered through English class because I knew I had a goal in mind and I had a person who was looking at me to be successful in that field. And so anyways, getting to the, getting to the point of the matter, giving students the opportunity to have access to industry at a young age is huge. And that's part of our program. Um, Barriers from the students, uh, okay? When you look at students, limited awareness of the opportunities that are out there, stigma towards skills and the traits, limited access to paid internships and shadowing. Part of the grants and part of the things that we're looking at and some of the things that are being coordinated through Chris are those examples of internships and shadowing that our kids need, okay? And those are huge because that also provides the opportunity for them to have a perspective other than what they're getting uh, in school or from their parents or from their grandparents or guardians or whoever they're living with. And then barriers that uh, are from the workforce to the student, generational communication. Uh, students, I think teachers know this, um, I certainly know it. Um, I've been in education for 42 years, and the students that we have now in Generation Y are not the same as the students that I taught in 1980 when I started, okay? Um, they definitely have a different mindset, they have a different uh, outlook on life, which is fine, okay? But it's not necessarily understandable if I've been in industry for a long time and I'm working in industry, and I am my age, and I have not been around kids, okay? Because, for example, my own daughters. I think my, my oldest daughter posted on uh, Facebook, and she is a very successful uh, professional. Money is not important, it's experiences in life that I am in tune with, okay? And that is generation one, completely, okay? Yes, do they want to be successful? Yes, do they want to have money? Yes, they do. But what they really want are experiences in life. Okay? Life experiences are much more important to them. And they view that as a success model for themselves. Now, a lot of us, especially my age, that's not how I grew up. And it's very hard to understand that concept. But through our work, I think that we're going to be able to kind of make a dent and an imprint on some of our industries so that they know how to work with our students and then get them engaged in careers in the region. 
Um, we have a professional by the name of Mark Perna who's working with us on that. And um, I think that the, I think for sure that uh, our teaching staff at BOCES have really gained some insight on Generation Y because of that. Okay. Um, in order for us to be successful, it's going to take a team effort. And in a minute, I'm going to let uh, Chris and Martha talk about the grants and how we have set the program in. Uh, in Gen, about how we're implementing the program in order to make sure that we're going to be successful at getting these barriers taken care of. Okay. Ladies. Thank you. So part of my job as a work-based learning coordinator of the Career Destinations program is to do a lot of what is on the screen. Part of it is to go out into the schools make a connection with the staff, make a connection with the students, find out what it is that they want to do in life, and explore that. And some of the tools that we're using are career trees. We start out with the basics, the fundamentals, and then we go from there. We talk about what it might take to be in manufacturing or agriculture, and then what is that pathway that they have to take to get there. We also look at employability profiles. What do they need to get hired into a job? And everything that I'm talking about is also a conversation with the employers, the community, the businesses. So we're all on the same page. We all know the same language. We know that it's a tenant. We know that they have to work on their work ethic. We know that they have to take the responsibility for their own learning. So when we look at all of that, we also have some um, opportunities for them to earn badges, like credentials. So what that would tell a student, a parent, a business, I've done this, I've excelled at this, I am above average in this department. It might be a hands-on skill that maybe they've learned in, say, welding or building trades. It could be that it's the employability profile, and they have perfect attendance. So there's a wide variety of opportunities out there for them to show off that they've excelled in an area. And part of that is to build some of their portfolio that they can take with them, add to the resumes. Some of the coaching is for the champions. Each district has a liaison that I can work with that knows the staff, they know the students, they know the communities. They're making those connections. They're helping to identify what is needed within the community, within the region. We're making those connections together. They know your community the best. We're also talking to businesses. We're trying to find coaches and mentors. And as I said, it's talking to those businesses to get everybody on the same page, making sure that we're filling those gaps. We're meeting everybody's needs the best that we can. And the way to do that is the communication, keeping everybody on the same page. Some of the ways that we do that, making those connections, is the work-based learning opportunities. It's summer internships that Martha's going to share a little bit about with the funding from the grants. But it's the shadows that the students can do. It's going out, it's doing internships, whether they're paid or not paid. It's asking businesses, do they have mentors and do they have coaches? It's the field trip. It's bringing those businesses to the students in different ways and opportunities, bringing them into the schools, and showing the students how do I connect with those businesses. And a lot of students, they don't even know what's in their communities right now. So it's also a little bit of education to the students that these businesses are here. These businesses need you. You have what they need. And making those connections as well as we go through all their opportunities and other pathways to get them there. Thank you, Chris. And one of the key points I want to point out, uh, Chris did talk about the uh, champions, the local champions. These are people who we all know. Um, I, I know that uh, when I was in Madison, my office professional was the person that knew every family in the community and knew that maybe this person had gone to college, was not successful, came home, has a high school diploma, but does not have job skills. And so we're going to look for also adult learners that were not successful in college to be able to provide them with opportunities to come and get trained and get job skills. 
Um, our next piece, I think I'm going to have Martha talk a little bit about the uh, ARC grants, uh, the regional grants that we're looking for. We have two successful grants and then one more in the queue. So in three years, we'll be able to have grant funding that's going to implement the program. We have currently 12 school districts that are interested in being part of the program this year. We started young with two or three. And now, because of the funding and the drive that we've got going and the energy behind the program, it's been really exciting to get to this point. So, Martha, if you want to give us just a real quick snap. Okay, thank you. Very good. I will be very brief, I promise. Uh, we should be very proud that the uh, region, ACM Mobile Business Region, is on the, is on the focal point for the Malaysia Regional Commission. This is what's going on. What we're doing is out there, is on the edge. This is not everyday business. The first grant application we put was to create an army, an army of uh, champions that at the school will help us connect those kids to jobs. It's simple. There are jobs out there. There are people who have a passion to help the kids connect to their careers, and we just need to make the connection. So the Appalachian Regional Commission provided us with the funding to make this happen. The second grant was just approved by the same uh, organization, and this one is my, my most excited, I'm excited about. It's going to provide money for the kids to go for four weeks on a paid internship right after graduation. And a, in order for the employers to compete for that funding, they need to provide us with a plan that will do an introduction to the job, but also an onboarding to keep them. So that is really good news coming down. And then our next one for next year is going to be even more exciting because this one now is going to create an army of mentors. It's going to recruit mentors in the three counties that we serve so that these mentors can take over one kid at a time and make a difference. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, we're very excited. This is going to be another wonderful year for us. Thank you, Martha. And I'm going to turn it over to Jen Wayne to talk a little bit about the numbers and the regional impact that we've had already. So, Jen, please. Thank you. Um, so, as Terry had mentioned earlier, we had started Destination a few years ago. We really gained momentum and then COVID struck. Um, so, we're really proud of the data, but we know that in the future years, um, we're excited to see where, where our, um, the opportunity takes our students. Um, so thus far, um, we have been able to serve just over a thousand students. Forty-eight of the students have been hired at graduation. Four hundred thirty-eight joined career exploration events. They were um, events that actually were redesigned this past year because of COVID. Typically, some of the events, well, all of the events were in-person activities, um, but we um, created virtual opportunities for students to participate. 198 students participated in regional job fairs. Um, we were able to connect with 61 businesses. Um, 50 employers joined us in our classrooms in a variety of capacities. We participated with over 120 worksite experiences. Um, our employers joined our regional job fair. We were able to secure more than 40 um, employers to participate and interact and network with our students. Um, if you look at um, the funds that we raised as well, um, referring to the grants that Martha was explaining. Um, so over the past several years, we've been able to provide this service to several of our districts. Um, we've started small. We've been working with three districts um, to be able to fund the work we have source the Appalachian Regional Commission, but we're excited about our next steps moving forward um, and the opportunities for the students in the region. When I think about destinations, I think about um, the purpose and the passion and the connection to the importance of what they're actually doing day to day in a classroom. While they're sitting in math or they're sitting in English, they may not realize the purpose behind what they're doing Destinations gives them the connection to whatever their goal may be. Gives them the drive, the purpose, and fuels their passion to move forward. So it's exciting to see those for our students. 
Thank you, Jen. And in conclusion, I guess probably I left you with a question, at least I hope I did. Uh, I am obviously not a veteran. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I always say that uh, God has a plan and I'm just glad I'm in it. And uh, one day I was uh, chopping a field of corn after I came home from college in the fall, and the school board president came walking across the field. And he says, we've been through uh, four ag teachers in the last five months up at school. He said, would you uh, consider coming up and applying? And I said, no. <laughs> and then I went home and talked to, uh, I, I had the reason to talk to me, right, from parents and grandparents. So obviously I apply and here I am. So, but one, I guess the moral of that story is um, my grades were really based on the fact that I had somebody that was interested in it. And I think that's one of the key components of this program. And the other piece of this is our schools are overloaded with mandates. And as our counselors are overloaded and our principals are overloaded, sometimes the last thing that gets taken care of is career work. Okay. And so this program really is designed in its complete entirety, and we're not there yet, to start with students who are at a very young age, say third or fourth grade, and then start building a career portfolio as they grow through school, so that when they get done, they have a resume, they have been interviewed, they have had uh, some type of work experience. Okay, so that when they go out and are graduating and going off to college and it's successful in college, they know how to do an interview after college. Or if they're not successful at college, they know that they can come here and they can get more training and be successful in the career. We need to also hook kids here in our community, in our region. The only way we can do that is by changing the message. Okay? We have got to stop saying you need to go away from here because there are good jobs here and we need our kids to stay here. So with that, um, there's a whole lot more behind this story, uh, but I'm not going to tell it tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity and invitation to be here and my team does as well. Do you have any questions? All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Harry. And uh, yes, you guys are more than welcome to stay, but we won't be offended if you if you go. <laughs> Thank you. We have a long drive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do. No, thank you again for coming out to Delphi tonight for sharing this information with us. Um, we know that part of our district vision is to not only excel as leaders in academics, but also to ensure that our students are ready when they leave our doors to enter a diverse and dynamic society. Those are the words of our district vision. And it's important that we continue to mobilize various resources that enable us to ensure that our students are prepared to move in that direction. As we move forward, we'll be talking more about work-based learning opportunities. We'll be more talking more about developing uh, programs within our comprehensive school counseling plan that ensures that students, not just in third grade, but starting in kindergarten, have opportunities to start talking about and becoming intimate with what their futures can hold for them. So this is just one piece um, to, to help move that ship forward uh, as we continue on that pursuit to realize our district vision. So thank you, Fitz right in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Mr. Schultz, who's going to do a presentation for Title I and Title A. He probably turned the switch. Might take me longer to walk up here than go through the presentation. <laughs> Are you hearing? Yes. Everyone? Yes. All right. So along with the $20 million budget, we also have federal grants that are part of the district, uh, part of the district's finances. 
I mean, roughly about six hundred fifteen thousand dollars in federal grants, and that includes uh, UPK right now. I'm not including the two hundred eighty thousand dollars in the CARES Act. That's a one-time shot that was state funded. Um, <clears throat> definitely not including the uh, the two most recent ESSER and Gears funding. Uh, that equates to about a little over two point four, two point five million dollars. So that's above and beyond what our normal yearly federal grants are. So when we do our applications, <clears throat> some of them are pretty simple. A couple pieces of paper, a couple questions, we send them in. And then some are a little bit more intricate, like a Title I, 2A, uh, 611, and 619. So I just wanted to go over real quick. We are obligated to kind of do a little bit of a public presentation for the Title I consol Consolidated Act. So I just wanted to talk about it. We started doing this last year. I'm sorry. Uh, you might know the federal grants is part of uh, No Child Left Behind Act, which we've talked about a million times. Uh, that was changed to Every Student Succeeds Act two years ago. Um, and that basically covers Title I, 2A, and Title IVA. Uh, they're all formula driven. We don't get to ask for the amount of money and then they say, well, you're going to get this much. They basically tell you at the beginning of the year, in July, this is what you're allocating. It's all formula driven. So it's a lot of the data that we give to the state or federal government based upon Fed's data or any kind of financial data that comes out of the business office. Um, it basically stays kind of the same. We have any drastic changes within the wealth ratio, which we haven't had that situation, or student counts it would shift that a lot. Uh, some of it is actually driven by uh, frame reduced lunch. So we have seen some increases and decreases through the years. And since I've been here, last six years, it relatively stays about the same. Um, really, a lot of these grants are to, they really look at and try to target uh, social economic uh, situations and try to look at um, disadvantaged students. A lot of it, when you look at where we Put the funding, we tend to, our office tends to look at certain things, um, certain grants as far as might be testing for students. Uh, it could be a lot of it's salary driven. We have a tendency to allocate a lot of money towards the salaries of those teachers that are in special ed classes or teaching special ed, AIS being a big one. Um, one of them, Title One, that's where mainly all the salaries go. We, we seem to, uh, we target the Primary school AIS teachers and their salaries. Uh, $230,000 is what we're allocating for this year. We've seen a decrease in that, and I wouldn't say it's a decrease in funding altogether for the Title I piece. They split Title I into A and D. Uh, we, the D part of it was for incarcerated youth, which we have a jail right here in our district, which we're obligated to educate those students who are incarcerated. We've seen a huge decrease. We have about a twenty-eight thousand dollar budget for that uh, out of federal monies. We've seen that drop quite a bit. In the fact that a lot of the younger students that are incarcerated were moved out to another county, and that has dropped to about three grand. So we we were educating probably a dozen different students, that not from just our district, but from other adjoining districts. Um, and now we're seeing maybe two to three a year. So that has, that funding has dropped. Uh, it's also, like I said, it was parceled off to Part D instead of just combining both of them in Part A. Second one is Title II A. Uh, that has dropped a little bit also, not too much. We ended up with about 20, almost $24,000 funded this year. We've allocated those funds into two pieces. One is mentoring. Any new teacher that comes into the district, they end up, they have a mentor for the year. Uh, it's a contractual amount. So usually we have a veteran teacher within that same program that mentors that new teacher for the, uh, the 10 months. We are estimating about 10 new, I think we're at nine, but we didn't end up budgeting 10 teachers for next year, 10 mentors. Uh, and then the rest we use for uh, professional development, which we continue to do. We did a lot last year. We'll do we'll still do uh, quite a bit this year too. The last piece is uh, student support and academic enrichment. 
we uh, look at certain teachers and we can, we, they make some changes as far as their uh, teaching for the next year, we will allocate money for that. We are around $18,000 in 4A funding, and uh, that's directly, uh, it's associated with salaries we, we allocate for that. That's my presentation. <laughs> Not much of the presentation is more informative than anything else. So, you have any questions regarding federal grants? Just, you know, these federal grants are 12 months, so they either start in September and end in August, or start July 1st and end uh, in June. I will say that the larger grants that we just talked about at the beginning of this, the years, and the are they are for three years. Okay, the public may address the board. Uh, public comments submitted to the district clerk prior to the board meeting will be read. The board will not respond to the comments and questions during the meeting, but may refer to the appropriate administration to follow up with the individual submitting the comments. The Board of Education believes that open communications with our parents, students, teachers, personnel, and district residents is very important. For this reason, the Board sets aside time at the beginning and end of each regular meeting for public comments. However, in order to focus on tonight's previously scheduled agenda, as a general rule, the Board will not be able to respond to your comments and questions at this time. You may refer your comments and questions to the administration for follow-up, or we may add the subject of your comments to the agenda of a future meeting. Either way, please be assured that we welcome and take your comments very seriously. The board asks each person to limit comments to not more than two minutes. In order for the district clerk to maintain accurate records of the meeting, each individual is requested to state his or her name and address. Do you have any public comments? Okay. Move on to routine matters. Uh, motion, please, to approve the minutes of the annual reorganizational meeting held on July 14th, 2021. So moved. And a second? Second. Lucy, thank you. All in, any questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, the motion is carried. A motion, please, to approve the <coughs> minutes of the regular meeting held on July 14th, 2021. So moved. I'll second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? And the motion is carried. A motion, please, to approve minutes of the special meeting held on August 13th, 2021. Sold. And a second, please. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and the motion is carried. At this time, um, we'll do personnel recommendations, but before we start, I would like to take a moment to introduce Danielle Beach, our new special ed teacher. She was appointed at our last meeting. So if you'd like to say hello or. <laughs> Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity, and I'm very excited to come to my alma mater. Um, I'm going to talk about the Special Education. Yeah, welcome. Oh, welcome. Very, yes, very welcome. We are equally as excited to have you. Danielle was in her classroom already today, setting up and getting ready, and and just uh, informed me that it was near completion. So you know, for somebody who's ready to roll, she's she's ready to go. So thanks for coming today. Yeah, welcome aboard. Thank you. Okay, so I will. Take a motion, please, to go down through the miscellaneous appointments um, through Joseph Greenfield. So moved. 
Seth in a second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Any questions or comments? Okay. Any opposed? And the motion is carried. Um, a motion, please, for Lois Haight as a certified retired DA substitute teacher. So moved. Well, in a second. Second. Shepard, any questions or comments? Seth? I'll abstain, please. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? A. And the motion is carried. And then we will do the remainder of the personnel appointments down to and including the leave of absence. Motion, please. So moved. And a second. Second. Let's see. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And the motion is carried. For the record, there are no financial reports for August 23rd, 2021. A motion, please, to accept the special education report from the Director of Special Ed and Student Services for 20, August 23rd, 2021, as submitted. So moved. And a second, please. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. We'll move on to our reports and the principal's monthly report. Mrs. Mabel. with Robin Robbins' report. I have her report and my own um, for tonight. So I thought I'd start with hers um, today. She says she's excited to announce that we've hired a new business teacher, Katherine Whitaker. She comes to us with over 20 years of experience and she'll be teaching business math, personal money management through TC3, accounting, and seventh grade technology and coding. This will allow us to offer our students more electives and courses that are business related and their interest surveys have shown us that this is an interest area for many students. Nancy Piper will now be teaching the Math 8 students along with Algebra 1. She's a certified math teacher and she has a great rapport with the middle school students. We had 16 students take and pass driver education course with Sean Newman as the teacher this summer. 11 students were transported to BOCES for summer school Monday through Thursday from July 7th to August 12, 2021. All but one student who stopped attending passed all of their courses and will now be caught up with the rest of their class. Altogether, sixth through 12th grade, we had two students who will not be able to move forward with the rest of their class due to their credit accruals. All students who took advantage of the recovery programs that we provided this summer were promoted. We will be having our sixth grade orientation on 831 um, 2021 at 6 p.m. in the high school auditorium and our ninth grade orientation on 9-1-2021 at 6 p.m. in the high school auditorium. Letters to all of our students will be going home by the end of this week. Schedules will be included in those mailings. And she was blessed to be able to attend wonderful PD and opportunities to connect with fellow principals and administrators in the region this summer. I attended the DCM, she attended the DCMO <laughs> Bosey's Principals Leadership at the Otisaga. The Lynx um, Professional Development facilitated by, my, by Julie. <laughs> and um, our administrative retreat in Essex, New York, hosted by the Brilliant Pathways. And Kristen Shearer was a big um, person to get that uh, coordinated for us. 
Thank you so much for allowing me to attend these events. Since I've been at DA, I've not been able to participate in such amazing PD, and I feel excited and rejuvenated about all that we will be doing in the new year to make sure that our students are receiving the best learning possible. So that's Robin's report. Now, Ma. <laughs> so I, I missed, uh, we all missed um, the July meeting because um, Kristen and uh, Robin and I were at the Leadership Academy at, over at the Otisaga, and that was a really great two-day event um, put on by the DCMO BOSIS. So we did that. Um, then I did two weeks of letters training. Um, the second portion, as you remember two years ago, I did the first portion. I did the second portion, and I had 20 elementary teachers with me um, doing the, the training. Um, it was an online, it was online, and you, you read part of the day, and you did online work, and then we came back together as a group and discussed different things. Um, it was a great two weeks. Uh, really went well. Um, we held the lottery for the pre-K. We had, when we first did the lottery, we had 18 students and two who uh, didn't make it in the first round. Um, after that, we had a parent call in and ask to have their student also placed on the waiting list. All three of those students have now been placed in the class because we had three parents who didn't understand that it was a full day program, full, full week program, and um, opted not to have their child come. And I have one other parent who has called and asked to be on the waiting list, so I still have one person on the waiting list. So hopefully that's gonna go well. Well, not hopefully, it is gonna go well. I know it's going well. Um, I've been to the farmer's market a couple times. We did, as I said, do links planning. Links planning is when we uh, meet with a whole group of teachers and our um, guidance counselors and all the administrative staff, and we talk about um, our comprehensive planning for the next year. And really, it, we kind of try and talk about three years out. Um, so we talk specifically about this year, um, and that will be shared in another um, board meeting. Then we had the administrative retreat and training in Essex, like Robin said. Um, I've done several walkthroughs up in my building. Uh, we will be opening that building before everything is completed, uh, but we'll be able to use a lot of the areas and, and be ready to roll. Um, they will get that construction completed, I believe, on second shift um, starting in the fall. Um, Right now I'm working on class lists and schedules. Uh, as you might imagine, that's a little more precarious this year than, than usual. Um, we do have 18 pre-K and about 45 kindergarten students signed up. I am looking for a long-term sub for a first grade teacher. I'm looking for a special education teacher. I'm looking for an AIS math teacher and an elementary school nurse. So if you know of anybody who wants any of those positions, I'd be happy to talk with them. At the Give high me school, a call. we're still looking for the ad teacher as well. And at the high school, we're still looking for the ad teacher, so please give Robin a call on that. <laughs> That's all I have. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, departmental reports. Athletic director, Jeff Ferrara. Mm. <laughs> He's got to go up too. <laughs> uh, I'll be very brief tonight. I wanted to share a quick story as I started. Uh, this morning I woke up at about 7 o'clock and thought about about 115 young men and women heading to Delaware Academy. Uh, the dew was still on the ground. The fields were freshly painted. Thank you to Mr. Sissio's crew. We have to find fleeting moments between rain showers to get work like that done for us on time, and they did a great job again this year. Um, and it's a weird feeling. I, I, I remember way back to my father dropping me off to the first day of practice when I was in school. Um, and it's the first time I've got to have this feeling since we, uh, our last full athletic season began in November 2019. It's been a long, long time since we started a full, complete, and what appears to be going to be a fairly normal athletic season for the 2021-22 school year. Um, Mrs. Zimmerman covered most of what I was going to talk to you about tonight during her presentation earlier. 
Uh, we're going to mirror what the school is doing. We're going to mask indoors for now. We are going to uh, have optional masking outdoors and wait for further guidance, hopefully later this week, from our new governor. Uh, one thing that I, I think is important to note that was kind of briefly touched on is I feel like we have some low or high hanging fruit, like the outdoor sports that are uh, deemed to be safer, and we have some low hanging fruit like the high risk and the indoor sports. Um, the best way to make sure we have a full and robust athletic season as, as we all so badly want to do after the ones we went through last year is, is to um, try to get as many of our young men and women as possible um, through the vaccination process and help, hope to guarantee that our teams can play a full uh, season of scheduled games this year. Other than that, we had a great start today and uh, looking forward to the rest of the fall season. Building and Grounds, David Sissio. Well, um, it's been a lovely summer here. <laughs> uh, we did, uh, by the second week of August, we had all the classrooms completely redone, uh, re- um, uh, what's the word I'm looking wax. for? We do wax, yeah, but there's a disinfected, I guess is what you want to call it. Um, so that was, uh, they said they never got them done that fast, but they worked hard, so they did it. Um, we did remove a few dead trees that were out in the front. Uh, we um, moved six offices, which was a real treat. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we did do a lot of painting. I had a, a young lady who did a lot of painting for us. Uh, she did the whole front side of the, uh, the school here. Uh, hand railings were all done. Uh, we replaced a couple water coolers that needed to be refilled into bottle fillers instead of the regulars because they can't use those. But uh, other than that, that's about all we got. So, so Mr. Sissio is being very humble. Um, that, that is a far cry from the totality of the work that this department has been doing all summer, not to mention the fact that they've been dodging construction and capital project and contractors uh, and trying to advance everything that we need to have done locally to open schools uh, in spite of varied schedules that we've been experiencing with capital project. So um, I'm beyond impressed. Uh, that they have truly surpassed expectations in their work uh, so far this summer. So thank you, Mr. Susan, and, and your entire department. Mr. Schultz. I thought you were saying he was being humble and thanking you. How to <laughs> No, that was completely that was serious. Nice, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I uh, second Mr. Zimmerman's um, gratitude toward David and his staff. Uh, he probably comes into my office about four or five times a day, and we both look at each other like we don't really want to see each other, but we know it's pretty important. So, um, yeah, we have a lot to get done, and not only do we have a lot to get done, but the contractors have a lot to get done in the next, I think we counted about 15 days. Yeah. Four of them being a weekend and one being a holiday. Yeah. So, um, you know, I kept the board afloat uh, week to week on where we're at with things. Um, we're a little behind on certain items. Uh, uh, the cafeteria being a big one. Um, hopefully we will have that. The, the seating area is the most important thing and ensure that Julie's teachers are, uh, and their students are not eating in the classroom, but rather in a regular cafeteria. Uh, the kitchen area looks like as of today, there should be probably the first or second week of September. Uh, we've met with Chris on logistics of that. Bathrooms up in this building uh, are taking a little longer than expected. Uh, we are shooting for six full bathrooms for students to have access to at opening day. We're hoping that number stays the same. So. That's in addition to 
bathrooms will be accessible in that part of the project as well. Exactly, yeah. So we have all the pods have their bathrooms uh, still intact. Um, we're talking about the major, we had 11 bathrooms total. I think 10 up here, one in the elementary that was added mm -hmm. to the cafeteria. So we'll slowly chip away um, at that. We sent them a nice email uh, today, making sure that they get, especially a lot of the stuff out of these hallways so David's crew can get back out and cleaning mm -hmm. uh, and get it ready in uh, tip top shape for students on the set. So. Uh, we also had a CWC kickoff meeting last week. Um, the meeting went very well. Uh, they will start, they were supposed to be here, I think, either Friday or today down at Smith Pond to do some surveying. Uh, then they will start Monday of next week. That's my understanding right now. Uh, they will work from Smith Pond up, probably get around to the circle, and that's probably about where they're going to stop. And that project will now be a two-year project, and they'll start the rest of it and go all the way up to the elementary next summer. Of course, they're going to be disrupting quite a bit, including this parking lot over here uh, and all the piping that goes up to the elementary. Um, we finished the year. <clears throat> I, I apologize there are no financial reports. I know you guys are really looking forward to them this, this month. Uh, but we tend to not do the financial reports in uh, the August board meeting only because we're in the middle of the audit at the same time. So changes are being made here and there, slight adjustments. We'd rather not give you the financial reports now and then have to reissue them in September. So you'll get the uh, July, August, and most likely if we have time, the September reports all in the same month as September. So I just want to apologize for that. Uh, audit looks good. They were here last week. Uh, as far as financially, we finished about 93% of the budget spent. Uh, that's usually about 94%. If you remember last year, we went into the budget season with a lot of unknowns. We padded the budget quite a bit in fear of a 20% aid cuts. They did happen at the beginning, and then they pulled them back. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why you probably see another extra percentage point or two of unspent funds. Uh, the recommendation I'll have at the next board meeting to uh, move that money into reserves. So, any questions? That project that they're going to be starting, will that involve that drainage problem by the elementary school uh, parking lot that all of a sudden we get a sinkhole? Uh, I don't think so. Um, that is a whole other project, actually. That's something we're eyeing into the next project. I think that is more of an issue, not with uh, stormwater drainage, but more of the sub base that's underneath that. Um, unfortunately, that's something that started to kind of, if you recall, this project that we're in the middle of now started, I want to say that the concept started about five years ago, and probably about two years ago after we had voted and approved, that started to really yeah. deteriorate. And we've looked at it, it's, it's getting pretty bad, and we understand that. So we're looking at a in the fall, doing another kickoff meeting uh, with the committee and starting another project of roughly about three and a half million dollars. We've kind of tied that about three and a quarter to three and a half. That will be there in that piece. It has to be. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, I just want to let the board know real quick. I, I will be out of the district starting Wednesday, and I will be out until the, at least the thirteenth of September. A little surgery. Oh. So, if you need anything, please email me. Um, I don't know if I'll get around to it the first week, but I will in the second, I promise. Um, but email, yeah, email Kelly. Uh, <laughs> the uh, office changes, please email Kelly on that one too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Good. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, food services. Christine Miller. Let's get a rotator cut. Um, I just wanted to thank Harry. We did a little walkthrough this morning or early afternoon in the elementary cafeteria, and I was really excited to see what they have going on up there, and my staff are very anxious to come back and be in that new kitchen. Um, so some of the things we're looking forward to, um, having our students back full-time, 
UPK through 12th grade, my staff love doing different things for our students, and our students like coming into the cafeteria and seeing what's new for the day. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on our menus, trying to build back what the students are used to seeing. So um, new for this coming year or continuation is we will be operating what's called a seamless summer option. So all of our students, UPK through 12, will be receiving a free breakfast and free lunch meal, um, regardless of their income eligibility. So I'm just thankful that that's continuing. So every single child I know will have a meal. Um, and then this summer, what we've been working on, we have a wonderful staff member that's been coming in every Wednesday and helping me. We've been feeding 55 students um, a breakfast and a lunch meal, five meals, five breakfasts, five lunches for the week. Um, and I'm very thankful for the parents that have been coming out. Not every single parent can get there, so the other parents are picking up for them, making sure those summer meals go out as well. Um, so I just can't thank everybody enough for jumping in and getting our children fed. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, special education and student services. Kristen Shearer. Here, just said, watch your step. Mm -hmm. He thinks I follow a lot. That's Julie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so we have been busy in special ed office. Um, we were a benefactor of a moved office, so thank you, Dave. Um, we have officially moved. Um, we're in the middle school wing now. Dawn was just moved uh, last week, and so it's nice to, to have us back together again. Um, we will have some new phone numbers, fax numbers, so we'll make sure that we communicate that on the website. Um, so 43 meetings since the last time we were together. Um, CSE 504 and CP CPSE meetings. Um, we have been compiling our new student list and we'll be holding all of those transfer meetings next week. Um, so we're looking forward to meeting and, and introducing those new families to our school. Uh, along with professional development, everyone's been talking a little bit about that DCMO leadership workshop and Julie and Robin did have a really great time. Um, I mean, the BOCES, did, they did such a great job with that program, and we love the presentation that, that Perry did today because we learned a lot about that when we were on our, um, at that leadership workshop. I did attend a New York case, which is the New York State Council for Administrators of Special Ed Conference. I did the virtual law conference, um, was involved in links training, which um, quite frankly, I'd never been involved in before, and it was um, really well done, Julie. So. And I learned a lot about our district through that, that process. Um, you met Danielle Beach earlier today. Um, she's such an amazing addition to our already superb staff. Um, and we have, um, Kim Bodo has moved into our 611 special class. And she's been doing some professional development. And she's just a rock star. She has embraced that, that program. And I'm really excited for our students that, that are going to enter that. Um, as far as um, some of the things that we've been doing with our school counselors, uh, they spent two days with me um, doing some professional development. We worked on the updating our comprehensive plan to reflect the changes in ASCA's national model. It's the fourth edition. We worked on our communication plan, and that's how we're going to let our stakeholders know who we are and what we do um, and how we do it and how to find information about us. So updating our web page and planning our newsletters for the year, um, and our student services guide. Uh, they have um, been working tirelessly on their scope and sequence for career information and readiness and social emotional learning. And our high school counselors participated in the middle school and high school RTI process team development, which is going to be really important moving forward. Um, Mrs. Zimmerman talked about some of those things that we're putting in place to help students um, with that gap that we were talking about, and AIS is a big part of that. And then um, just spent a lot of time um, updating our documents, um, our special education plan, and like I said, meeting with new families. So it's been a busy summer. Any questions? No? Nope. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Technology, Luke Pyrzeba. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so the technology department's been doing some 
big things over the summer. Um, gone through and reviewed all of our Chromebooks for grades one through nine, swapped any of the older out of, device, out of date devices with new ones. We're probably in about 300 or so for swapping. Um, we're working on our 10th grade refresh and kindergarten new account setup this week, and we'll be working on those deployments. Then we're currently underway with a big uh, deployment of new devices and new to us uh, for our 11th and 12th graders going to Windows laptops um, to kind of meet with where programs are headed and um, build that out. Um, we've also upgraded to the latest versions of Windows 10. We've been pushing out a lot of updates and getting things set across the, the district for protection purposes. Uh, we continue to work on finalizing those classroom setups in terms of uh, setting up and moves and offices and a lot of our time was set just pulling cables for where new people would be in different places. Um, probably pulled four or 5,000 feet of cable throughout the district and terminated things and just to get things where they need to be. Um, we've also deployed 45 new access points throughout the high school, uh, middle school, a lot of spaces where we need to do a wireless uh, refresh. Um, still need to complete a couple rollovers in terms of food services and nurse programs. Um, so we still have quite a bit on our plate, um, but we're confident that we should be able to pull it off as, as planned. Um, and that's our hope, so. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, transportation, Greg Versbar. Good evening. Um, uh, we also were part of Puppet's transfer and um, going through that process. Uh, one of the, don't have a whole lot to report other than to add on to what Kelly was saying about the uh, transportation. There isn't a whole lot changing there and that masks and all that's more public transportation as she said um, and I don't foresee that changing. The big change though is that we're not limited to space on the buses this year. They are saying that we can fill the capacity and go along with that. I, again, with masks, uh, they're saying social distance, that's okay. Um, with that plan, that will change things. Um, typically, this time of year, we get quite a few people that are looking to uh, get bus affiliations and numbers and different um, groups and stuff to say what, what's the bus route and what, what kids are going where. That's a lot of changes that are coming in right now. We got a lot of kids that are entering into the district. We rolled over, take 12th graders out from last year, and then we roll everybody over, plus add the UPK in there and the new kindergartners. So it does alter the route. So a lot of that needs to be finessed and work and find out before we can start dedicating buses to different um, large groups and stuff like that. So that stuff usually comes out last week, just before Labor Day, we'll get it out. And again, it's all subject to change afterwards. Other than that, um, summer maintenance long, difficult, we're, we're in a good place. And superintendent's report, Zimmerman. All right, the only thing I have left is uh, we do have a new teacher orientation that is scheduled for September 1st, and our opening day uh, return for all faculty and staff will be on September 2nd. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite the entire board uh, to join us for part or all of uh, each or both of those days uh, to come in and to uh, meet our staff, meet our new teachers, and uh, see what we have planned for the year. Thank you. Okay, it's time for our board committee reports. Um, understanding, of course, that we probably have not had a lot of activity up to this point, but um, AL Kellogg Committee. I believe you guys met. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we uh, met, but there was only three of us present, and so uh, we did not have a quorum. Okay. So we could not have an official meeting, and uh, so we had a non-meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Athletic committee. We have not met. Nope. Oh. Uh, board liaison. I'm. Nope. Not in the summer. Capital project. Um, we did not meet. 
a finance committee. Um, we did meet, but I think pretty much everything we talked about was covered in capital project updates and the CWC updates. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any. No. 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 Have we held policy? Um, yep. No policy and no technology. No. So I'm um, anticipating our next meeting. We will have a bit more activity for you. Okay. There are no policies to review or adopt for this meeting. There is no old business. Um, we are going to table the HVAC systems service agreement um, until our next meeting. At this time, I'd like a motion, please, to approve the education elements contract agreement dated August 23rd, 21. So moved. Seth and a second. 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 Okay. Any questions or comments? Did you want to give a brief explanation? As uh, sure, I can certainly do that. Yes. Yep. I've included in all of your packets just some additional literature. This is a part of. Uh, of our initiative in moving forward our instructional platforms, uh, primarily focused on professional development for our teachers uh, to continue to move us forward in our goals for the fall. Uh, we went to some depth at our last meeting uh, on this in particular, uh, but I provided just some additional uh, literature for your review, and certainly if you have any questions specific to that, um, I'd be happy to answer them, but thank you for your support in, in providing another resource for us. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. So I need a motion, please, to approve the tax levy. So moved. And a second? Second. You any questions or comments? Okay. Okay, this this does require a roll call. Um, the Board of Education of Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi authorizes the sum of nine million eight hundred and twenty six thousand three hundred and forty seven dollars for school taxes to be raised in real property taxes. Therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Education fix the equalized tax rates by town and confirm the extension of the taxes as they appear on the following described tax rolls. And it is hereby directed that the tax warrant of the Board duly signed shall be affixed to the above described tax rolls authorizing the collection of said taxes to begin September 1st, 2021 and end November 10th, 2021 giving the warrant an effective period of 66 days at the expiration, at which time the tax collector shall make an accounting in writing to the Board of Education. And it is further directed the delinquent tax penalties shall be fixed as follows. September 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021, no penalty. October 1st, 2021 through October 31st, 2021, 2% penalty added November 1st, 2021 through November 10th, 2021, 3% penalty added. You wanted to go ahead and do the... Tammy Newman? Yes. Seth Hayes? Yes. Lucy Kelly? Yes. Sean Letty? Is that here? No. Tim Shepard? Yes. James Tucker? Yes. A motion, please, to approve the Timber Sales Bid Award. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, any questions or comments? 
Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay. Uh, one other one thing. When will the trails be back online? Is, did we do we know that? Because they were offline for a bit. Are they back or is it done or which which trails? I, I know were, were the original the hiking did, trails yeah, you're referring to? Yeah. <clears throat> um, is that back yet or I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't aware that they were closed necessarily. I think the entry point was when they started. Uh, on the on the, the Sheldon Buscar. Park yes, side? Yes. Okay. But I'm not this is from months ago when they started. I remember they yes. were like last year they yeah. were closing them. Yep. Yeah. Even though they weren't doing anything. Yeah. I can contact yeah. the village and find out. Yeah. That'd yep. be great. Um, I have a question. James? And I know I know this has been asked and answered, but um, where will this money go to that we get from the lumber? Uh, we haven't definitively decided that yet, um, but this this goes, Carrie, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, that the proceeds from this go back to general fund, and the district has the ability to redirect that in whatever way that, that we see fit, because it's not taxpayer dollars. Um, and so, but we have not definitively determined that yet, but that's a discussion with the board that we'll have. Okay, the Board of Education awarded a contract to Northeast Timber Services on May 24th, 2021 to assist Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi in procuring timber sales. And whereas Northeast Timber Services obtained the bids for lumber sales as follows, Wagner Millwork LLC owned by Green Lumber, $267,617. Gutchess Lumber Company, Inc., $203,216. Sasha Amhe, $182,000. Craig Benjamin, $181,500. Klein & Sons Logging, $155,042.01. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Northeast Timber Services, Hereby awards the timber sales bid to Green Lumber Company LP in Davenport, New York in the amount of $267,617. And be it further resolved, the Board of Education authorizes Superintendent Kelly M. Zimmerman to sign the agreement between Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi and Green Lumber Company. A motion, please, to approve the services agreement between Public Consulting Group, LLC, and Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi. So moved. And a second? Second. Kim, thank you. Any questions or comments? I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, what percentage does the overseer of this get? Are you to back to the timber sales? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, do you know the percentage carry off the top of your head? Uh, well, I need to hear the full question. You're just looking at the district share. The, the percentage, how does that break down between what the district recuperates and what the, um, what the, um, We have the consultant. The you're Northeast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Northeast, Tim, right. The district share is around 223,000. Okay, 267. Right. The percentage of the day. Yeah. yeah. 10%. Okay, back to our motion at hand. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay, the motion is carried. Board of Education approves a services agreement between Public Consulting Group LLC and Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi in the amount of $750 for the purpose of teacher professional development and coaching with playbook. A motion please to accept a donation from St. John's Episcopal Church, the amount of $151 for use in our backpack program. Up in a second, Lucy, thank you. Any questions or comments? Just thank you so much on behalf of the district for that generous donation. Um, we are We'll absolutely continue our backpack program uh, to provide needs for any student who um, wishes to take advantage of that, and we'll certainly get a thank you card out to them. Great. Very good. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and the motion is carried. 
Um, again, I will invite the public to address the board. It appears we again have no public comments. We will entertain board comments. Kim. I don't have any comments. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment, of course, definitely Mr. Sissio's, uh, him and his crew, but the times that I've been here, I, I uh, am amazed that anybody could do any work during the summer uh, with all the noise that goes on uh, and the thumping and and um, and the smells and uh, I so I, I really commend every uh, office staff and administrator who uh, guidance who have been here during the summer and uh, it's already uh, looking like our old school so uh, I'm very pleased peeked into the bathrooms and saw the sheet rock up and it's getting there. But thank you, thank you for all that we've been, uh, you've endured. Thanks. Seth? Yeah, thank you for, uh, especially the reopening committee, for all the work that, that uh, they're doing, you're doing. Um, it, it's, I think, a really tall order to go back to this. I think we all had hoped everything was just going to go away and this year was going to go off without having to do any of this, but we're back at the table. But I, I like that there's innovative thought being put into what's coming out of our plans. And I appreciate the, the thought to how we can drive our own outcomes. And, um, you know, look forward to more discussion about testing and ways that we can get a feeling for where we stand district-wide with our own um, metrics. So I really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, all the work additionally that we do every year to get ready to have our students back. I think it's really good to hear also in the plan that we're, we're moving forward, you know, mm -hmm. educationally, even though last year was, um, you know, I think, a really good effort to, to have as much normal as we could throughout the year. In those circumstances, you know, now with people back full time, I think the the message I heard from you know uh, Kelly's presentation was that we're we're back to to normal educationally, and it may mean PPE and masks, but uh, that doesn't mean that we're slowing up because we still have the theme of COVID going on. It's it's back to back to the basics. So I appreciate that, and really appreciate everybody's support in getting um, us back. So thank you. James? Uh, no comment. Okay, I would like to just take a minute to just kind of piggyback on what Seth and, and Lucy said. There's been a tremendous amount of work that's gone into um, Delaware Academy this, this summer from capital project to reopening and everything in between and um, I too thoroughly am so happy to see our focus on moving forward despite COVID and any curveballs that are being thrown at us. Um, can dodge a COVID, you can dodge a wrench, you can right. dodge, a, <laughs> dodge a dodgeball. Um, but we're, some exciting things happen. I was really thrilled with the the presentation from BOCES and what we've what we've got um, getting started with the partnership with those folks as well and it's it's all student centered we remain student centered and it's it's really really great to see the directions that we're going in so thank you to everyone everyone involved And with that, um, I don't believe we, our next meeting is Monday, September 20th at 5 p.m. The board, it is anticipated, will convene an executive session at 5 and return to open session at 6. The deadline for items to be placed on the board agenda is the Tuesday prior to each Board of Education meeting. If you have questions, please contact the, contact the district clerk at 
1306. And at this time, I will take a motion to adjourn the meeting as we do not have a second executive session. So, second. Okay, thank you.